Hi, friends, and welcome back to the Gradient Podcast. We interview various people who research, build, use, or think about AI, including academics, engineers, artists, entrepreneurs, and more. I am your host, Daniel Bashir, and I have been particularly excited about this episode. Today, I'm speaking to Ken Liu, who is an author of Speculative Fiction, a winner of the Nebula, Hugo, and World Fantasy Awards. He is author of the Silk Punk epic fantasy series Dandelion Dynasty and short story collections The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories and The Hidden Girl and Other Stories. Prior to writing full-time, Ken worked as a software engineer, corporate lawyer, and litigation consultant. Whether you're somebody who reads science fiction or not, I think this is a really valuable conversation. Reflecting on the world we're in and understanding the implications of what we imagine and build is really vital to creating a society we want to live in. I think Ken is incredibly articulate in explaining how the imaginative worlds of science fiction allow us to better investigate and understand how we're living and the technologies that we use every day. As always, if you aren't already subscribed to The Gradient, go ahead and follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast. You can also follow us on Substack, where you'll get notifications whenever we release a new podcast episode, article, or newsletter. And now, without further ado, Ken Liu. Well, Ken, first, I really want to thank you for doing this with me today and taking the time to chat. As somebody who's been a fan of your science fiction for a while, I'm broadly aware of your story. But for any listeners who might not be so familiar, would you mind just giving us a rundown? Feel free to take it as slow as you wish to how you kind of got to writing science fiction and to how you think about doing and writing, doing the writing of science fiction. Thank you so much for having me uh, here, Daniel. Um, so uh, my story is both simple and not so simple. <laughs> it's simple in that, um, you know, I'm a writer and I, 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 I write the, uh, stories, I tell stories. Um, it's not so simple in that the way I got here is kind of circuitous. Um, so I started out, um, you know, somebody, a neutral observer watching my life might think I, it seems like I just don't know what I'm doing. So I started out my life, um, in college as, um, English major. Uh, but I took a lot of sci-fi, not sci-fi, uh, computer science classes. So I ended up working in the tech industry right after graduation, but I always wanted to write, um, in some way. Um, in fact, in some ways that was, what attracted me to computer programming in the first place, I was very interested in the idea of creating symbolic machines, engineer artifacts out of symbols, which are, you know, describes both stories and programs, as well as uh, legal documents, which is, you know, a second career I had. Uh, but anyway, uh, as a programmer, um, I, I really loved the way programmers think. Um, I, I loved solving problems and, and sort of creating abstract machines and, and, and getting the software to basically implement any functionality that you can imagine. Um, you know, the whole idea of, of the flexibility of software was extremely appealing to me. I, I loved it, trying to learn the, uh, the different programming paradigms and, and trying to solve the problems that I wanted to solve. Uh, it, was, uh, it was something that I was deeply um, enamored with. Uh, and began my, you know, uh, lifelong love of, uh, of technology. But throughout that entire time, I was also trying my hand at writing and I didn't at first know what sort of stories I wanted to write. I think for me, um, you know, because I was an English major, I always thought about literature in this very meta, um, form. Uh, I was thinking about what, what were stories really? Because stories are kind of, strange and confusing if you really think about it, right? Because what is an act of storytelling about? 
um, it's it's actually weird. I haven't seen this discussed a lot in linguistics, but I, I think it actually matters. A lot of times when we talk about language, we focus on communicative acts, meaning a human being tries to communicate an idea to the other person, such as, I'm going to sneak up um, this mammoth from the front. The two of you go from the back so we can flank it and bring it down. Like you can see how that kind of communication is extremely important and probably how language evolved in the first place. It's a survival, you know, tactic. And it's 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 a tool for communication. So that's what we focus on. But storytelling doesn't seem to quite fit into that pattern because when somebody tells a story, the the story that's in the writer's mind and the story that the reader takes away from it is completely different. I've been struck over and over again by how what I intended to say in the story is not what readers read out of it. Um, this is not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. It just is a thing. Um, great literature, in fact, seems to share the, uh, you know, great stories seem to share this feature where readers from wildly divergent backgrounds can take very different things out of it. I think that kind of multivalence, that kind of being amenable to multiple interpretations is very critical. You know, something like, say, the Iliad, which, you know, somebody who is a, a warmonger can read as a very pro-war kind of poem. And someone who's a pacifist can see it as a very anti-war poem. You can get both messages out of it if you want. And, and if you want to focus on something else, you can also read the poem as being about that. That's why it's it's open. But in that sense, it's all works of art, especially if they're great works of art, fail as acts of communication because they don't necessarily communicate what the writer intended to the reader. The reader is going to contemplate the piece of art and get something out of it. To me, that's an aspect of art that's deeply interesting to me um, that I don't see a lot of discussion about. And I think that may be why we can talk about this a little bit later, because I, I'm also, you know, one of the reasons I got into computer science was my interest in uh, machine assisted or machine augmented creativity and uh, the nature of art as a unstable, unstable or failed act of communication may have something to do with the role machines can play in it. Anyway, so I worked in the tech industry for a number of years um, before I decided to switch to law, um, largely because um, there was uh, the tech industry crash um, in the early 2000s and the startup that I was with, um, you know, uh, went down uh, and I decided to switch careers and go into uh, law, um, which was also deeply interesting to me uh, for similar reasons. Again, you're creating abstract machines out of symbols, uh, except this time it's a contract or a brief, not like programming. But in contrast to story writing, legal writing is very much about communication and successful communication. Instead of being open to interpretation, you have to be not open to interpretation. It's very interesting. Um, but then when it comes down to it, the law is also about storytelling. Uh, you know, I learned that litigation is largely a matter of competing narratives. And it's it's just fascinating to me that legal reasoning attempts to get at the result by following a set of rules. But the rules really originate from competing narratives about what the good life is, what is justice, what is fairness, what is rehabilitation, what is... Um, the best way to redistribute risk, you know, whatever have you. It's it's a story, competing stories end up being embodied in these legal rules. And rules don't make sense unless you understand the stories behind them. So to me, that was also a very fascinating sort of exercise. Um, anyway, throughout this entire time, working as a lawyer, working as a programmer, um, and then later on working as a litigation consultant in the high-tech industry, I was always striving to figure out what kind of stories I wanted to tell. So if stories are not, you know, they can't be communicative vehicles. They're not about communicating a message, whatever that means. I've always said that if you really have a clear message you want to communicate, you should not do it in fiction. You, you have to do it in the form of an essay. Fiction is just not good for communicating messages. Fiction is good for other things. It's it's open to interpretation. It's, it's, it's about emotional experiences. It's about uh, the logic of metaphors. And so you have to figure out what it is you're trying to do. If that appeals to you, 
what are you trying to do? What what are the stories you're trying to tell? I ended up settling on the idea of tangible metaphors. So it's the, it's the idea that um, you know all literature is based on the logic of metaphors, but some literature is much more explicit about the metaphors that they're using, and it's about taking a metaphor and making it literally true in the world in the fictional world. So, for example, we may metaphorically speak about alienation of modernity, the sense that in the modern world, we don't, we feel alienated, we don't feel connected to people around us. In fact, oftentimes, I think um, some of us, especially those of us who are gamers, have experienced this sort of illusion that maybe everybody, all the strangers we meet in the world are just NPCs, like in the, in the Matrix. They're not real. Only we are real with a rich inner life. Everybody else is just an NPC that sense of alienation. So that's a, obviously a metaphorical concept, but you can make that literally true. What if you write a story about a world in which some people really aren't human, they just pretend to be human? And how can you tell them apart? Um, what is it that makes someone human? How do you tell humans and human-like robots apart? Maybe it's empathy. Maybe you have to give them a test. And that's how you end up with something like, do androids dream of electric sheep or Blade Runner, which I don't think is about AI at all. I think it's about the sense of alienation in modernity. It's a, it's a concrete metaphor to explore that concept. Um, and, and the sort of sci-fi I enjoy writing is like that. Um, I didn't even start out thinking of what I um, write as sci-fi because I don't really distinguish between sci-fi and fantasy. I know, you know, some for some writers and some readers, that distinction is very important. To me, it's not. Um, to me, whether your metaphors are technological or magical, ultimately the point is it's a metaphorical exploration that you're making tangible and concrete in your world so that you can really get into it and figure out what it means for the human condition. And that's as far as it goes in terms of communicating a message. You try to see some aspect of reality that is interesting to you that other people hadn't discussed before or you hadn't seen discussed explored in a way that you were thinking about. And so you try to put that into onto the page. Um, you try to construct a story that embodies that vision of, of reality, uh, and then readers will have to take away what they can out of it, what they want, what they um, can based on their own experience, based on their own expectations, based on their own framework about how to interpret reality. Um, and that, to me, is, is the most magical part of, of fiction writing, that sense that I can take this view of reality in my head, embody it in a story, like building a house, and then watch readers move into those houses and unpack their own possessions and try to create their own imaginative life inside those stories. It's really interesting and wonderful. And so as I was saying, you know, my career went from being a programmer to a corporate lawyer to being a litigation consultant, um, in which capacity I ended up studying a lot about the history of technology and the history of patents and inventions and innovation. So I learned a lot about the history of innovation and how innovation actually works. And so I ended up paradoxically realizing that uh, a lot of popular understanding about what sci-fi writers try to do and what sci-fi, where sci-fi's value is, um, you know, these ideas are just wrong. Sci-fi is not very good at predicting the future, and sci-fi writers rarely try to predict the future. At least the sci-fi writers I admire don't really think that's what they're doing. Um, they're all using sci-fi as a lens to examine reality. Uh, predicting the future is not possible, nor something that sci-fi writers are particularly interested in doing. And uh, the value of sci-fi as a genre really isn't um, in, in predicting the future. It's about illuminating aspects of reality that realist literature often is blind to, especially in regards to our relationship to technology and our nature as cyborgs. Um, you know, humans have been cyborgs, I would argue, from the day the first language, the first utterances that we would classify as language um, were invented. Uh, because from that moment, humans ceased to be entirely biological beings. We started to be shaped by our technology, which I consider language to be one. Our craft 
shapes us in the same way that we shape craft. We have co-evolved with our craft, um, and we've been cyborgs, you know, for millennia. Um, and sci-fi is a genre that really recognizes the cyborg nature of humanity and tries to elevate technology into a core part of humanity. In contrast to a lot of realist fiction, which does not recognize it. Um, so that, to me, is the value of sci-fi and why I'm attracted to it. My love of technology, of concrete, tangible metaphors, um, ends up being particularly well embodied in sci-fi. Um, so I know that's a very long and meandering kind of answer, but in some ways it captures the messiness of of and and the, the sort of unique shape of my own career. Um, so yeah, that's 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 my story. I thought that was really beautiful and meandering in the best of ways. I, I feel there are a lot of different things to take away from what you just said. And maybe where I'll start is that comment you had broadly on stories and storytelling as a failure of communication, just because I found that articulation so beautiful. It's something I've been thinking about a lot myself recently. I don't know if you've read it, but Sally Rooney had a very recent talk that got written up in the Paris Review called Misreading Ulysses. And mm. I think she makes a very, a very similar point. And I guess anybody who has read Ulysses will kind of viscerally understand how difficult it is to piece together everything that is going on. And so her point there is each reader coming to such a complex work with their own set of life experiences with their own set of things that they might understand out of the references that Joyce makes is going to take away something that is quite different. And I guess I'm also kind of experiencing that myself right now um, with various things I've been reading where you take a sufficiently complex work and there are just going to be so many different ideas and references bandied about. And it's kind of hopeless to understand all of them. There are so many guidebooks and things you can kind of follow along. And I do find those really helpful. But I do think that for a reader kind of examining a work of fiction, like there are certain things you can know with footnotes or a guidebook and you kind of see those in a declarative fashion. But I think what maybe you were getting at is there are more there are aspects that might have been a part of your education or your upbringing that are kind of more core to your being, as it were. And those are probably what allow you to take certain things away from the story, as it were. Did I kind of read what you were saying, right? That is absolutely correct. That is exactly what I was getting at. See, that's an example of a success in communication <laughs> where <laughs> I tried to convey an idea and I actually managed to do it. Um, so let me add a little bit to that. I haven't read that essay, but it sounds wonderful. And it sounds like exactly, um, you know, a much more beautiful, articulate way of saying what I was trying to get at. Um, I will say this, right? So I phrase it, I, I phrase it this way by saying that a great piece of art is a failure in communication, you know, obviously somewhat facetiously and to be provocative. But I think there is a kernel of truth to it. So what I want to say is this. I think a lot of us have been unconsciously or consciously sort of misinformed by our education system, right? When you're trying to take, you know, study literature in middle school or whatever, we all had this experience where the teacher was trying to tell us, what is the author's message, right? What is the thing you're supposed to take away from this work? So we've been taught to think that that's, ha that's actually how you're supposed to read books. You're supposed to figure out what the message is. Books are puzzles. Like authors have a message that they want to convey to you and they don't want to come out and say it. So they're going to hide it in all these symbols and whatnot and, and convey it to you. Uh, um, Roland Barthes, a uh, great French um, critic, a literary critic, um, had a, a, a metaphor for, for this. He said that, you know, traditional criticism treats the author of a text as God. And interpretation is really about trying to figure out what God meant. It's about discerning the will of God right, <laughs> in the text. So that's why you study the author's life. You try to read it biographically. You try to 
interpret the symbols based on what the author was. I mean, we still see um, evidence of this style of reading throughout, right? We 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 see uh, articles all the time saying, "Oh, you know, uh, this novel actually is autobiographical, right? This this is about the author's life." Or you can't understand this novel unless you belong to the author's culture and you interpret it this way. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those approaches in particular. Those are interpretive approaches, like any other interpretive approach. But I think my point here is that is not the only way to engage with art. In fact, for many artists, that is not at all the way they envision their own art. The way for some of us, like me, uh, I'll use a metaphor to sort of uh, explain this again. For for somebody like me, um, the reason I create art is really because, you know, like I was saying earlier, I notice some aspect of reality that strikes me as deeply beautiful and interesting, and I hadn't seen presented, discussed, embodied before. So sort of like you're, you're a kid, you're out in the woods uh, playing and hiking by yourself, and you suddenly look up and you see this incredible sight. A dragon is flying overhead in the sky. It's a frigging dragon. It is the most amazing thing ever. And so you come home and you're like, I want to show everybody that dragon. And then you try to do the best you can. And it turns out that you cannot paint dragons. It's not possible to capture dragons by mere words or pigments or paper folding or sculptures. It's just not. The essence of the dragon escapes the tangible representation. So you try everything you can. You try to paint the forest the moment after the dragon is gone, that yearning for the dragon. You try to paint the sunset after the dragon has left. You paint the yearning, the heartache into it. You try to record a song in which you give the reader a sense of your own heartache for the absence of the dragon. You try everything you can to give the reader that sense of that aspect of reality you experience. So you put it out there. Now, readers will try to, uh, will encounter this work, and then they have to um, interpret it according to the story they lived themselves, right? All of us live um, complicated lives, and we accumulate a group of stories that become our core mythology, right? The way we were loved as children shapes, in many ways, how we understand love. The way we were harmed as children shapes, in many ways, how we think about trauma. And so when we come to this painting about the dragon, right, they, they, readers will take away different things. Some readers will see the, the forest and be reminded of their own journey through the forest as a child. So they'll be reminded of that. Some readers will come to it and see uh, a clump of, uh, of mushrooms in a corner and they'll be fixated on that because it speaks to them. Some readers will come to it and imagine their own adventures in the woods. A few readers will also get that sense of something grand, beautiful, passing through the woods. And those are the readers who will get some echo of what I was trying to do, that aspect of reality. And those are probably the closest we can come to being a communicative act in art. But other readers are not taking away um, nothing. They, they, they are putting themselves into the work and creating a new experience that they can take away with them that's based on their own core being. And those are beautiful, too. Um, as long as the work of art engages with you and gives you that kind of experience, I think you end up with something beautiful and, and, and cool. And if more of our education around art were based on this empathetic way of experiencing art rather than this, did you get the right message? Did you get the wrong message? What is the message? Is the message good? Those kind of debates are not interesting to me. I think trying to empathetically understand a piece of art and trying to see the degree to which we can get beautiful things about the human condition out of a piece of art. Different aspects. That, to me, is much more interesting. So in some ways, a piece of art is a failure of communication, but in some ways, it's also a great success of communication, but it's about self-communication. It's not about communication from the writer to the reader or from the painter to the viewer. It's about an experience from the viewer to the viewer herself. It's it's that kind of self-reflective communicative experience that I think is deeply interesting. The educational aspect is interesting, and I'm sure people can relate 
to those middle and high school English classes where you were asked to write a report on a book or what you took away from it. And really what was going on was the teacher had a set of things to say about the book. And if you didn't totally agree with the teacher's interpretation of the book, you were probably going to get a B at best. And I, I agree with you that that just does a disservice to any book of sufficient complexity. I think there, there are definitely plenty of stories out there that are written with certain intentions or certain messages to convey. And I think that when you read them, you can kind of peel that layer back and see, okay, sure. this is just making a very specific point here. Well, a lot of fables are like that, right? Fables are yeah. deliberately written to teach, so they do have a message, and I get that. But not all stories are that way. Precisely. And I think when you encounter any work of sufficient complexity, you can try that, what is the author, quote-unquote, really trying to say mm -hmm. here, inferring God's will, as it were, mm -hmm. like you said. Mm -hmm. But then the question does arise, why would you write something like that, <laughs> as opposed to something much more simplistic? And right. I think this definitely relates to, to science fiction, too, in that I I would imagine that writers like Joyce, like Gaddis, maybe, when they are thinking about the world, about art, what they see around them, there's something that they're experiencing, but then there's also maybe something that they haven't quite resolved themselves, or that feels just too complex for them to capture in a declarative manner for me to, to just say words to you. And so that has to come out in the form of a story, I think. Well, 100%. That's often how I feel. I mean, you know, uh, to give you an example, you know, something I've worked on for many years, the, the epic fantasy series I wrote, The Dundalant Dynasty, you know, people may ask, what is the message here? And my answer would be, there is no message. I, <laughs> if I knew what the message was, I would have just written the message. Um, or, you know, what is the book about? I struggle to even describe it because describing the plot of the, the of the stories really doesn't do anything. The plot isn't the story. Um, it's sort of like, you know how you've all had these experiences where you're trying to explain to somebody why a game you're playing is really awesome. And they ask you what the game is about. And you're like, it's about saving a princess, but that's not really what it's about. Um, describing the plot of the game often just completely doesn't capture why it's interesting. Same way with with this book, uh, the series that I wrote. I mean, in some ways, it's um, it's 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 just a work that encapsulates everything I wanted to say about constitutionalism, about what it means to have a society that functions. What is, what does it mean to be a citizen in a world? What does it mean to watch a country like the United States struggle over its own soul? Um, and I put all of that in there, and and that's basically the work that I can I can put out. Um, and if there's a message in there, uh, I think it depends on what your own views are about these questions, and and you're gonna discern whatever answer you want out of it. Um, but you know, it captures an aspect of reality that I wanted to. Uh, that I found deeply interesting and that I didn't see anyone else put into those terms. So I wanted to do that. But a lot of, a lot of my stories are like that. Uh, they don't have, um, they don't have a, a message. If I knew what the message was, I would have just written the message. I wouldn't have bothered the story. Like you said, it's so complicated and multivalent and human that there's no other way to represent that human experience other than through a story because uh, this is the other thing that I, I, I wanted to say, which is um, I agree with Dickens in some sense. Um, Dickens is famous for having this theory about the narrated life. He believes that, you know, like in David Copperfield, we narrate ourselves into being. Our entire life is, is an act of self-narration, of constructing a story about who we are. Are we the hero of our own story or not? It's the question that torments us throughout our life. and then. We have to incorporate reality into that narrative. But at the same time, the narrative also changes the direction we take as we proceed through life. It's a, it's a mutually reinforcing kind of uh, relationship. And so trying to form the productive, useful, uplifting self-narrative is very important. And I think humans are not capable of understanding reality other than narrating it it's it's why the narrative fallacy is such is such a deep 
part of our engagement with the universe. And when the universe does not have a narrative necessarily, and we impose one on it, it's just as likely to lead to misunderstanding as it is to lead to actual understanding. I mean, to give you a very simple example, I think it's very, very, very hard for humans to understand the theory of evolution because we insist on putting a story into it. We insist on finding some sort of moral message into it. You know, what does survival of the fittest actually mean? What does evolution do? Is there a purpose purpose in shaping towards more intelligence, more complexity? Is there some sort of force that some cause and effect that pushes us in one direction versus the other? The idea that it's just random, it's just random, it's just math is deeply alien to us. We can't make sense of it. Our brains are just not capable of making sense of this stuff unless we put a story on it. So I think that's why stories are so important. We we are we evolved for whatever reason to understand reality in the form of stories. And so we have a hard time getting ourselves away from stories. Stories are probably the best way to incorporate and to get us to see aspects of reality and to experience it. Um, if we can narrate it, it might as well not exist for us in some sense. That's a really interesting perspective. I want to dive into the dandelion dynasty in just a second, but first, I wanted to pick out that last thing you just said of our having to understand the world through stories and not really being able to contend with it as something totally unstructured. I think there's a very parallel branch when you look at kind of modernist philosophy, the vaguely Kantian intuition that the understanding has to approach the world as though everything has reasons. And this principle of sufficient reason that kind of underlies a lot of the ways in which philosophers tried to construct metaphysical systems. And there are lots of perspectives on on where that actually leads you and how good of a way it is to go about the world. But I... Suppose in what you were just saying there, a story is one way I can, for myself, construct a reason for something. I see a certain phenomenon. In olden days, I might have constructed the the dragon or or an angry god as an instrumental reason for why the weather is so bad or why this place I saw just erupted in flames and I can't think of any other reason. And so it's... Interesting, I guess, how at one point the story kind of serves that construct of reason for us. But then as things advance, as the development of science occurs, that kind of flows into all of this. And we start thinking we have better and better reasons for things. But there is still that contending, as you said, between our having to impose this this structure on something that may or may not in and of itself actually admit that structure, but it's just kind of the way we have to approach it. Yeah, I, I, I think we, it will be interesting to understand, you know, exactly why evolutionarily we are, we evolved to be that way and, and, and whether all forms of intelligence must necessarily have a narrative bias or a narrative core added. I'm, I'm not sure that's true, right? Because um, I can imagine that we can construct artificial intelligences that do not have that kind of need to tell stories about everything. But humans are like that. We, we really do need to construct stories about things to, 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 to believe it, to accept it. I mean, you know, this is the most obvious in the way that we, um, we, we devote the most important aspects of ourselves into stories. I mean, modern nation states ask citizens to die all the time for stories you know we 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 construct histories which are just very large scale stories that attribute causes to effects um and and you can look at the same set of facts and filter them into any number of narratives um it's just very interesting how committed we are to stories and how i i, now I do want to be very careful here i don't mean that pejoratively. I think oftentimes when, when people bring up the, the, the way that humans are very story-driven, it's sometimes described as a negative thing. That's not quite right. Uh, stories are, are both good and bad. There, there are plenty of, of instances where stories lead us astray, but there are also plenty of ways in which stories lead us to do good things. 
to make, you know, being human uh, worthwhile. Um, we can't really, um, our values, what, what we consider to be right and wrong, these are not things that can find justification in some abstract, uh, pure logic way. We, we have to believe in the story for these values to make sense. Um, and um, what what is being human other than, you know, our values, the values we're willing to die for. And they are stories. Um, that doesn't make them somehow not real. It doesn't mean that they're not worthwhile. I would also see that as a, a really positive thing. We've spent some time on the why of stories, why we tell them, what function they play for us. And I want to transition a little bit to the how. So you brought up your work, The Dandelion Dynasty, earlier. And you use this term, silk punk for, as you describe it, the technology aesthetic you wanted for the series, as well as the literary approach you used in composing the books. And I'd love for you to maybe elaborate on that a little bit, and perhaps both parts of that, the aesthetic and then the approach. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, the Dungeon Dynasty came out of an observation I had um, that stuck with me and I, I couldn't let go. So I got to travel around the world quite a bit as an author to attend literary festivals and to just talk to authors and readers from all around, all around the globe. And one thing that struck me is um, some readers brought up to me this idea that modernity feels very translated to them, right? So if you're um, from a, a part of the world that isn't, you know, Europe or America, I guess, um, uh, a lot of um, modernity feels very Western because they were invented in the West. And so somebody might say to me, you know, at home, I speak my mother tongue to my parents, but my education in science, in economics, in everything was conducted in English or French or what have you. And when I go home to talk to my grandparents, my parents, I, I don't have the words to tell them these things other than using English or French. because even when I'm trying to use words in my mother tongue, they either don't exist or they are just direct translations from French or English or whatever. So modernity feels very translated. I think people who have studied other languages, especially non-European languages, will have this experience. A lot of the words um, about modernity are directly translated from English, um, usually. And so the sense of modernity being translated is is a very pervasive and then i was thinking oh that's interesting like and then i thought okay so in america you know which is you know some people call that the the one of the centers of modernity one of the inventors of modernity okay so do we americans experience modernity as translated and then at first i was like of course not because this is our language but then i was like well maybe we do because i thought about it and i realized that most of the words we use for science and economics have Greek and Latin roots, and they're not Anglo-Saxon words at all. Um, in fact, it's so pervasive that some of the stories, some of the words we use in everyday speech are not native Anglo-Saxon words, and we don't even think about it that way. Like story. Story obviously comes from as from the French, um, histoire, and it's, it's, uh, it means both story and history. And so history and story as English words are both derived from the Middle French word. So I was like, well, surely the Anglo-Saxons had a word for story. Um, and so I was looking into it, and I realized we did. The Anglo-Saxons had a word for story, and that, that word is spell. And that usage still survives in words like the Gospels, which are literally good spells or good stories. So if you read you know, something like Beowulf, um, they use spell to mean stories. So modernity is experienced even by us in the english world as a translated thing it's we 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 describe aspects of reality using greek and latin rooted words and because that's how the renaissance was the renaissance was, was an example of using these classical languages to describe to invent new words to describe a new reality um uh, that they wanted to capture so that gave me an idea if modernity is a translated experience even for us, what is it translated from, right? And and to me, you know, observing the way uh, America narrates about itself, we seem to often see ourselves 
as a continuation of Rome. Uh, that's probably the most common metaphor used for America. America as a, as a modern Rome. The way we do our pageantry, the way we compare football games to gladiators, the way we talk about the Senate, the way we talk about classical, the classical architecture for our government buildings. There's a sense in which America is consciously translating itself from Roman analogs, which to me is deeply uh, interesting. So I said, okay, well, that's one way of narrating the story of America as a, as a continuation of the story of Rome. But is that the only way? Is there another way to tell the story of America as a translation from something else? And I thought, okay, what if instead of using classical Roman references to discuss the modernity of America, what if I could imagine the emergence of a modernity like Americas using classical East Asian references? What if we saw America not as a classical rebirth, a rebirth of classical Rome, but as a rebirth of classical, say, Han Dynasty China? What if we could do that? What would that mean? How do we think about constitutionalism? How would federalism look like? How would we discuss the Bill of Rights? How would we think about what it means to have a democratic republic under these kind of conditions? Um, so that's what the Dangdang Dynasty was about. Uh, the, the Silk Punk aesthetic is about taking these classical East Asian references in philosophy, in mythology, whatever, and then transplanting them into a fantasy world where they can serve as the building blocks for an American style modernity. And this is a way for me to examine what are the things that we take for granted in the way we think about modernity. What are the blind spots we have when we use only one set of references as the translation source? What are the things that we don't notice when, when we do this? So it's a really interesting exercise for me on examining what American modernity actually means. What does it mean to, to have this modern multi-ethnic state? What does it mean to have a shared story? What does it mean to have a constitution? What does it mean to have founding fathers and founding mothers? And what are their messages to us? And how do we reinterpret their stories from generation to generation? So that's one aspect of Silk Punk, this idea of taking something old from classical East Asia and repurposing it for the construction of American-style modernity. The other aspect of it is much more literal, which is, you know, I'm deeply fascinated by technology and interesting technology and the history of innovation. So I was taking the idea of classical East Asian engineering, where um, it's a language, right, where the vocabulary is based on bamboo, animal sinew, wind, water, wood, paper, silk, all of these material of, of historical importance to East Asia. And I was using a sort of grammar of classical East Asian engineering, which placed an emphasis on craft, on improving in small steps, on trying to understand from nature and to imitate nature, biomimesis, and, and how we can use those kind of gramma grammatical terms and vocabulary to construct and elaborate on a technology vocabulary and, and, and grammar that will be capable of supporting modernity. So if you were trying to, say, invent the printing press using these classical East Asian concepts, but not the printing press as China actually had it, but a printing press that is more suited to modernity, the kind of uh, printing press that's capable of supporting a large literate society, what would that look like? What if you had to invent essentially a Turing complete language using classical East Asian engineering concepts? What would that look like? What if you had to uh, create essentially artificial intelligence under those conditions using those technological uh, means? Now, because I'm doing fantasy engineering, I don't have to be limited by physics per se. So if something can work within one or two orders of magnitude, I'm just going to say it's close enough for fantasy work. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with it. Reasonable. Um, right. So, so it ended up being a deeply fascinating exercise. You know, I um, looked into the, the history of uh, electrostatics, uh, especially uh, because Ben Franklin had done some wonderful work there. Um, and I imagine how you would construct electrostatic machines using classical East Asian engineering principles. Um, and, and what would they look like? 
you know, that's an example of the sort of thing I went through. I, I, for, for the whole series of books, I ended up inventing a huge number of silk punk machines that use classical East Asian engineering and materials to achieve results that we would undeniably describe as modern. So it's, it's, you know, essentially it's a, it's a series about the reinvention of modernity using an alternative translation source. Our modernity is translated from classical antiquity, meaning Rome and, 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 and Greece, largely as a result of the Renaissance. But what if we have a different way of doing this? What are the things we can discover about modernity? So in a, you know, in a, in a very, um, that to me is, is how I would describe the Dantan dynasty. It's, it's, an, it's, it, it's a story. I mean, without just describing the plot, it's a story about a people's struggle to emerge as a multi-ethnic state, um, with a shared story, um, that is stepping into modernity with confidence, um, and with a commitment to renewing its own national narrative from generation to generation. I do remember reading that you actually tried building some of the things you wanted to talk about in the Dandelion Dynasty, which I think is just really, really cool and a fun way to approach it. The other aspect of what you said, I think, really highlights how Silk Punk, even though we could use the words shorthand for technology aesthetic to describe it, it's something so much deeper than that. In a sense, it's you stepping back and saying, okay, when we think about the ways in which we approach these questions of constitutionalism, of federalism, of building a society. We we have a standard repertoire of concepts, of stories we draw upon. We have the Federalist Papers, Aristotle, and these themselves have kind of a set of ideas that they they tend to draw upon. And in in some ways, as you might have articulated it, this kind of in inflects the the grammar that we speak in lots of very subtle ways and this is kind of taking taking a step back and being like wait do we do we understand our own language well enough to perhaps rearticulate some of these things but under a different set of assumptions kind of expanding beyond that and i feel that's very very important to technologists trying to understand the changes we are undergoing with modern technology and understanding what are the impacts of these modern technologies and then how do we approach them? Because I think that some of the assumptions we make, I think, for example, in the West, there is often that very kind of liberalist presumption of like the sovereignty of the individual as the highest good, the most important thing. And that is in some ways a a truth that we take to be self-evident as it were. But when you step back a bit, as you have some of these, these things that seem so fundamental, maybe aren't as self-evident. And if you start to reframe, okay, what are the stories we tell ourselves about how the world came to be? What is the most fundamental unit of concern in a society? Then I feel the way that you start to approach questions of the impacts of technology, of how we should approach technology policy, they start to look a little bit different. Daniel, that was perfect. That was a great reaction. I mean, you, you, I feel like another amazing moment of success in communication because, um, you know, that's exactly what I tried to do with the Denver Dynasty. And, and your point about technologists is so spot on. I mean, just, you know, one of the things that I tend to obsess a little bit about is the degree to which we have sort of become locked into one particular interpretation of what autonomy for an individual actually means. We take it for granted that autonomy for the individual actually means separating from others and that if a decision is made with as little concern for others, then it's more autonomous. But I'm not sure that's supported historically, even within our own Western traditions. I mean, we certainly find that in a lot of scientific research and just based on our own personal experience, autonomy is fostered by a sense of connection with others. I mean, I feel like, you know, one of the things that the internet has allowed us to do is for us to feel um, 
in some sense, less lonely because now we realize that our interests are not just our own, that there are other people who share our interests. We can connect with people. You know, you can be fascinated by something incredibly obscure. You can be a fan of this cartoon that aired in Japan in 1972 for only two seasons, and you can find other fans who are just obsessed about it as you. And so you can actually, you know, connect. That sense of connection increases our sense of autonomy, of of being self-actualized and fulfilled. So connections are actually fundamental to the way we become individuals. To be individuals does not mean you sever yourself. It means in some ways you connect with others. And so fostering individuals, uh, individuality may be actually equivalent and, and perhaps even the same um, as fostering communities. They're not diametrically opposed, as some narratives would have us believe. And if that's the case, then that changes the way a lot of our technology thinking goes, right? So much of our technology and policymaking is being shaped by this idea of fostering individualism at the nuclear level of separation. You know, individuals and individual nuclear families must be determining their own fates. The idea of multi-generational homes is anathema. That's somehow negative towards autonomy. Uh, the idea of building walkable communities is is bad. We don't we don't need that. We need to have a car based point to point existence. Uh, everybody should be in their own isolated pods. But if we change that thinking and and sort of see individuality as being fostered by communities, then we need to build our cities and reshape our um, uh, social organization to foster communities. We need to have walkable city blocks. We need to have communities in which individuals don't have to drive to get everywhere. We need to have the ability for people to meet face to face, to to be able to um, have actual shared spaces that are not owned by corporations. Um, you know that changes the way we design things. Um, so, like like you were saying, I think it's incredibly important for us to understand our own language and understand how our own modernity is translated from other ideas and see if there are other possible sources of translation that will allow us to see biases and blind spots we just can't recognize otherwise and and truly build a a future that is um, human in the fullest sense. Now that we're kind of on the topic of technologists, there are a few things within the dandelion dynasty and kind of around it that you articulate. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time on. The first is this idea of the engineer as a poet, I believe is how you put it, that comes across in the series. And I'd love for you to expand on how you think about that. So uh, the the origin of that idea, the kernel of it, is in... um, um, uh, a book by W. Brian Arthur uh, on um, what technology is and how it works. Um, I think that's the title of the book. But he points out that technology, you know, we commonly understand technology as being derivative of science when for most of human history and even now, that's just not true. In fact, it's the reverse. In fact, uh, somebody like Nassim Nicholas Taleb has said something very similar. Both of those thinkers focus on the work of of technicians, of artisans, of those who actually practice the art. That is, there's a lot of tinkering, a lot of exploration going on without necessarily being based on understanding of the underlying fundamental scientific principle. There's a lot of engineering that happens based on simply figuring out what works and then slowly evolving on what works as opposed to deriving everything from fundamental scientific principles. And so technologists historically have been tinkerers. They, that's what they are. They, 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 they're not inventing things based on fundamental abstractions. They are, they're tinkering. Um, they're putting together new solutions from existing solutions by tweaking them, by improving on a little part here, a little part there, putting them together. Anybody who has programmed realized that this is actually very much what programming is like you you, you're not deriving everything from you're not writing everything from a fundamental um, uh, a a turing machine that's just not how we work we we are 
we're tinkers. We take libraries that work, we, we take things that work, and we modify it, and we put little bits together until they do what we want, and we improve on little things here and there. But fundamentally, it's about tinkering. It's about craft. It's about making things. And it turns out that that part of engineering is not all that different from what poets do. You know, when you learn to write poetry or learn to write stories, you learn basically there are a set of techniques and tropes that people have practiced over the centuries. And when you what you want to do is put them together, innovate on them, and make little improvements here and there. And once in a while, you invent something wholly new based on something outside of poetry. But fundamentally, you learn a repertoire of tools and techniques that you then put together to achieve very new results in a way very similar to how technologists solve problems. They, they, they take components, existing components or sub-assemblies and figure out under the constraints we're working with her, how do we put them together to achieve the result we want? How do we build the machine we want to do this thing using these known components and, and putting them together in novel ways? Uh, so that's a driving image throughout the series. Um, I focus a lot on this kind of innovation based on tinkering, um, not so much on fundamental scientific discovery per se. It's interesting how tinkering in many ways can produce things that look like fundamental scientific discoveries. Somebody I spoke to recently, Jiang Chen Cho, made the very good point that the transformer architecture, something that as many listeners will know, has very much revolutionized the world of deep learning in all sorts of ways. The pieces that came together to form that architecture were already there. And the ability to put those together in the right way to create something out of them is itself a really difficult and beautiful act of synthesis. It is in one sense tinkering, but then in another sense, a, a very real creation. And if all the pieces were there and putting them together were just as easy as following a recipe that anybody could, then I think we'd have had it long before attention is all you need came out. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's why I think a lot of times people who have not done a lot of crafting or a lot of working technology underestimate the degree of creativity involved in engineering, even the simplest, most basic kind of engineering. I mean, you know, I, I have a hobby of repairing old video game consoles. Mm -hmm. And it's just so fascinating to me to open up these old consoles like old Game Boys and whatnot and sort of see the creativity involved in laying out the circuits. Just something as simple as getting those components on there in a way to allow them to not interfere with each other and to flow and to fit inside that case and to do the things they do. It's so cool. I mean, you open up these old machines and see the amount of creativity that the designers put in there to make this work um, under the constraints they had to work under. It's just amazing. You know, they really are very beautiful works of art. And uh, like you say, a lot of times tinkering is what actually leads to these fundamental discoveries. They are, you know, Nassim Nicholas Taleb has said that science is often uh, advanced by engineering as opposed to vice versa. We often think science leads engineering, but it's often the other way around. It's it's people tinkering that leads to actually new discoveries that then in turn lead to more innovation the other direction. Uh, but, but technology pushed its science ahead as much as the other way around, if not more so. Yeah, I think we are seeing this very clearly right now in the world of AI, just with so many advances in large language models being a combination of fundamental scientific ideas, but combined with the ability to actually engineer them at scale. There mm -hmm. is something I want to kind of pick on, uh, still related to the Dandelion Dynasty for a moment, before we kind of move on to more AI-related things. You said in one interview that the technology language isn't just about how to build things, but how to construct societies. And I think we've touched on this a little bit, but I feel this really informs a view on what it means to be a technologist. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that question, perhaps a little bit more explicitly. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I've, I've said to, um, uh, to various interviewers is that I don't view technology as limited only to artifacts, like the things we make. I, I also think technology 
encompasses things like organs of decision making, you know, juries, legislatures, courts, uh, lobbyists, um, to um, forms, to ideologies, to religions, to mind shaping craft of various sorts. These are all constructs. They're craft, and and, and they in turn shape how we how we how we approach the world. So of course they are also forms of technology because they are they are craft. They're created things. Winston Churchill, um, when uh, he was trying to uh, uh, give a talk about rebuilding the House of Commons after uh, World War II, uh, so the House of Commons was you know uh, destroyed and they had to rebuild it, um, and at the time there was a debate over what shape the new House of Commons would look like, and Winston Churchill was the one who said it should be rebuilt exactly the way it was, and he said the reason he his reason is very simple. He says you know. The shape of the House of Commons, this rectangular, angular thing, is intimately related to the shape of British democracy. We have a two-party system, an adversarial system of government and opposition. That system was shaped by this chamber. If this chamber were round or in some other way harmonious, then we wouldn't have the system that we have. So. He, he he very memorably said, we shape our houses, and then afterwards, the houses shape us. I've often sort of, because that quote, I think, later on was used um, by a lot of programming theorists to describe patterns in programming, but it's very deeply embedded in my thinking um, as a way to think about technology. So I mentioned earlier that we and our craft co-evolve. Human nature cannot be understood apart from the nature of our technology. This is a part of it. Um, our technology includes the way we organize our societies, the way we think about our obligations to each other, the way we think and picture the ideal life. Do we want to foster a society in which people live in distant houses separated from each other? Or do we want to foster a society in which houses are close together and people walk around to meet each other? Do we want to foster a world in which cars live in the streets and dominate the streets or a world in which children dominate the streets? These are all forms of technology. They are, they are visions about how we craft and shape our, um, uh, the, the, the shape of our lives. And I think as technologists, we are not limited only to inventing new machines. That's, that's, just a very limited view of what technology is. We are also very much involved in shaping the world. I mean, um, you know, if you believe that the world we live in is is fine the way it is, then you're just going to improve on little aspects of it and make it faster or quicker or whatever. So you live in a society full of cars, so you just invent electrical vehicles, better cars, um, and then you call it a day. I don't think that's, that's I think that's giving, um, that's, that's viewing technology as too limited, um, giving technology too limited a role. Why not think about technology? Can you disrupt the idea of a car-centric society altogether? Maybe electric bikes are a much grander and more interesting innovation in fostering um, a society that is human-scaled rather than car-scaled, um, something that's human-centric rather than car-centric. Um, so that's an example of the kind of thing that we that I think we need to do. That's a really interesting perspective. And I liked the way you described this, <clears throat> excuse me, as a process of co-evolving. I think that in a lot of discourse around technology ethics and sort of current things that we tend to discuss about our future with technology, I, I feel sometimes the language around it does kind of separate the people from the technology, like what, how do we want to create the technology? What do we want the technology to do for us? Yep. And it's like we're dealing with these two separate entities. But if you really take seriously the idea of even, even language as a sort of technology, and if you take that seriously, then you start to view just the act of, as you said, writing things, of changing the language you use as as also an act of engineering in a way. Yeah, I, I think that is absolutely true. I mean, there are sinister interpretations of that, you know, totalitarian societies, um, mm -hmm. Newspeak, right? You know, those are all examples of 
um, trying to change the technology of language for social control, for implementing a particular vision of those in power. But that that's not the only way to think of it. Um, there are a lot of ways in which um, technological change is about linguistic innovation um, at the very fundamental level, the way that technologists invent words for things that we don't have a word for. And the right words that we invent can really shape and craft um, uh, the way we, we approach things. I mean, uh, for example, it's a little it's a little weird to me in some ways that uh, we call uh, the devices, the portable computers we carry phones. Uh, the, the, the telephone function is literally one of the least interesting functions embodied in these devices. And yet that, because we call them phones, it shapes the way we think about them and what is appropriate and what are the roles we can assign to it and what are the things it can do. Uh, but what if we stop calling them phones? What if we call them something else? How would that change the way we think about their uses? If we started calling them just cameras, does that change the way that we we think about it? Um, and and does that change the way we think of what we think of as essential functions? You know, uh, I mean, these are just interesting thought experiments to run through and and and, and see what are the things we can do um, as a result. Yeah, I think this is a good place to segue into some of your work on on AI assisted creativity. So you participated in the Google WordCraft workshop, where, as I understand they had a number of writers co-write a story with their Lambda dialogue system. Do you want to tell me a little bit about what the aims of that project was, what your experience with it was like, Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps in particular your experience of of writing a story with their dialogue system? It's it's a fascinating um, exercise. I mean, you know, I've been interested in machine augmented creativity uh, since forever when I was in college. This was long before the days of, you know, the modern uh, deep learning systems. Um, I wrote a very simple AI system for generating um, uh, poetry in the style of Edna and Vincent Millay. Um, uh, and that was uh, one of my projects uh, in Kamsai. And at the time, I was very pleased with it. But I've always been interested in the idea of augmenting human creativity with machines. Um, you know, I'm not particularly uh, scared or whatever by the idea of machines replacing humans um, because I, I don't think that's even the right question. And I, I don't know, I don't know what that means. And and I, my personal feeling is if machines really can write stories better than I do, the sort of stories that I can write, then I don't really see the point of doing it myself. Um, the, the machines can do it. That's fine. Um, but I don't think machines can. And, and I'm more interested in how can machines help me tell more interesting stories? How can machines help me do things that I can't otherwise do? Um, I mean, fundamentally, you know, we've had our stories changed by technology throughout time. Um, just the very invention of writing itself changed the way we tell stories, um, a literate society and the way we craft sentences, the way we shape stories, the way we consume stories and tell stories. It's just these are all fundamentally different in a literate society versus an oral society. And, you know, more interestingly, we're sort of seeing a little bit of the reverse happening now because in the age of Snapchat and TikTok, a lot of our most important stories are now oral again, as opposed to written. So quite a bit of orality is seeping back into our storytelling versus the kind of literate storytelling we've been very used to for centuries. So I'm really excited to see what orality 2.0 will lead us, you know, where this is going to lead us. Um, but anyway, back to the machine assisted creativity. I, I view AI as just another interesting technology and I'm, I, I'd love to see how it can augment uh, what authors can do. And it turns out that the research group at Google was similarly interested. They were interested in, can they create and craft a tool for writers, specifically for fiction writers, that would help them write stories? So they invited a bunch of as uh, uh, professional uh, fiction writers to test out their uh, their their tool. And 
like you say, um, Lambda is, is uh, a very similar system to, you know, uh, GPT-3 or other large language models in that they've been trained, quote unquote, on the internet and they, they, um, are designed to, uh, engage, um, in this sort of chat based interface, uh, to, 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 uh, interact with the user. For Warcraft, they specifically building a lot of safety features um, um, because, as we all know, language models being trained on the internet can end up uh, generating a lot of um, sentences and words that are uh, potentially harmful uh, and offensive. And so they're putting a lot of uh, checks and, 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 uh, and guards to prevent that from happening so that will be a safer tool to use. So... I experimented with it, and it's very interesting the sort of things that it's good at and the things that it's not so good at. I found out very early on that um, tools like these large, large language models are not very good at crafting the kind of language I'm interested in. So this is not difficult to understand. It's because the corpus on which um, these tools are trained um, is largely communicative, right? Most of the words that you see on the internet are communicative. They're actually attempts to communicate. But as I mentioned, art often is not communicative in that sense. It's not purposive. Now, a lot of these models are trained also on a lot of fiction, a lot of fanfic, a lot of freely available classical fiction, out of copyright work, etc., what have you. But it's just one portion of it. The default tone and style coming out of these language models is sort of the um, eighth grade reading level, maybe even lower, um, newspaper prose explain things to you kind of prose, right? It's, it's meant to be communicative. The idea is let's make sure I can explain facts to you in a way that is not wrong. So there are certain things that these language models are very good at. So for example, you can ask these language models to explain quicksort to you using an episode of uh, My Little Pony. And it's very good at that because it's very purposive. It's very clear. It's being communicative. So these language models are really good at that. But if you're trying to do something like, you know, tell me a fairy tale about a robot and a concerned troll um, and uh, make it funny. That's a lot harder because, you know, it's, it's, it's a story. Like stories don't necessarily have a message. So what you end up seeing is a lot of the times these models will just meander. Um, so one of the things that a lot of these language models have is a limitation in terms of memory. Um, it's X number of tokens. That's basically how far back it can remember. So it loses context. It doesn't, it doesn't know. So the way this is typically solved is just by recursively feeding back the output into it to, to maintain some context. But, um, I found it to be very hard to get the tool to stay focused. Um, um, if the story grows beyond a certain length, the tool starts to sort of meander and go off. And it's, it's, it's very hard to, 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 to tell a story with these. I, I, I mean, the, the joke is when you're starting out as a new writer, they always tell you that the most important thing is you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. You gotta, you gotta actually have the whole story. And I feel like I can tell the same thing to, these tools because the AI tools are often very bad at having a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, but there are certain things uh, that the tool was really good at, and I found it really fun to sort of explore those. The tool is capable of just hallucinating certain things that are just crazy and wild and, and interesting and provocative, uh, things that you wouldn't necessarily do yourself. Uh, I mean, I was writing the story um, uh, with uh, uh, Warcraft, and I chose to write my story based on the idea of evaluative soliloquies. This is a concept in robotics where robots explicitly articulate their own decision process to allow the human user to feel comfortable and safe in interacting with the robot. So I was like, well, what if I told a bunch of stories in the form of these evaluative soliloquies by a robot? So a robot taxi would just evaluate, would soliloquize and, and describe its own state of mind that it's carrying these passengers around. And as I was doing it, Warcraft came up with the scenario of one passenger sitting in the lap of another passenger out of nowhere. There, there was no, I had no idea where this came from and why the Warcraft decided to go that. But I was like, okay, this is not what I thought. But 
you know, let's play the improv game of, you know, yes and, and we'll just go with it and see where it leads. And that turned out to be really quite a lot of fun. Um, so I guess my, my ultimate conclusion is that I, I think these AI tools are quite interesting, but they're not quite at the point where they can really revolutionize fiction writing or art, at least not for um, in terms of what I'm trying to do. Um, I was hoping for a brainstorming partner that can really um, play with my ideas and have a back and forth and really push me into doing things that I couldn't do on my own. Um, and the tool is really not anywhere near there. It's not, it's linguistically very uninteresting. I mean, in some ways, because current AI systems are geared towards making sense, right, which is communicative, that necessarily leads to a very bland kind of pro style, that necessarily leads to an avoidance of ambiguity, and necessarily a, a lack of playfulness um, or, or, or um, uh, transgressiveness in the way that they use language. But one thing that I always tell people is I think fiction writers always have to invent their own language to tell the stories that they want to tell. They can't just use the language that is given because those are all cliches. In order to tell an interesting story, writers must get beyond the set of cliches they're handed to, and they have to sort of invent their own language, their own set of metaphors. But current language models are designed explicitly to avoid that. They're trying to use cliché. They're trying to be communicative and clear, and that often means the most bland sort of prose possible. So, you know, in terms of prose style, you're never going to get anything useful out of current models in that regard. But they are, um, and they're also just not great at, at doing a lot of the things that writers are looking for in a creative partner. But there are certain things that it's good at, and then you have to know how to how to prop these systems and how to leverage what it's good at. Um, you know, I ended up using the tool as a sort of search engine of sorts. I would ask it to come up with a word for a situation that I, I was thinking of. Give me a new word for um, the first invention I'm thinking about. Um, things like that. Um, and, you know, sometimes it will give suggestions that are actually quite interesting. And I'll be like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that and, and maybe I'll modify a little bit, but I like it. At least in the form they exist today, I also kind of suspected that sort of conclusion that language models aren't going to be particularly helpful for the more playful, interesting aspects of human creation and writing. And this is maybe jumping ahead a little bit, but I guess your your story, Real Artists, from, from The Hidden Girl, kind of paints this picture of what being an artist might look like in a world where the computational <laughs> system does all the work. And I think it's a really interesting portrayal of this. Um, I, I feel doubtful that a future like that exists for writing. I mean, it's it's hard to say anything about the future when you project out long enough, but you just look at some of the incredible creativity you see in works of fiction. Um, like my kind of first novel of the year this year is, is The Recognitions. And there's this really interesting set of inventive tools Gaddis uses, like the main character, Wyatt, loses his name literally for about 600 pages of the book. And there's there's also an intentionality to the way in which, like, I think you can always figure out who he is, even in these kind of unattributed Joyce-like sort of dialogues that go on. But there's also an intentionality to the fact that you could reasonably confuse him with another character. And I think that there is something to be said about that. And sort of a, a system like today's that just kind of maybe is scaled up further, but is still intentionally there with the act of communication. Um, I don't see it being able to exhibit or, or play with that kind of mode of, of putting forth things. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I felt the same as you, but I, I do kind of want to use this as maybe a segue into some of your other short fiction. Um, and so the, the two collections of stories you've written, the paper menagerie and the hidden girl, um, which are just really, really beautiful, beautiful collections. Um, and I think that for me, they certainly caused me to kind of pause and reflect on a lot of the ways in which I think about technology and its impacts. And um, perhaps we can maybe talk about both some of the broad ideas there, what it's like to write short fiction for you, 
and then a few particular stories. But first, since we've already talked about the Dandelion Dynasty, maybe where we can start for these is just your experience of using short fiction as a medium as opposed to writing a novel and how you thought about sort of putting forth these ideas about reflecting on technology, the way we interact with it today, and where it can kind of take us in these collections. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting to me to reflect on this, because before I started writing novels, I, I thought short fiction and long-form fiction is very similar things. You know, one is just longer. Turns out they... They are not at all. Actually, they're they're just very different beasts. The sort of things you try you can do and and want to do in long form fiction um, are very different from the sort of things you can do and and end up wanting to do in short fiction. At least for me, you know, long fiction, long form fiction, like the Denzel Dynasty, for me is really about um, immersion, exploration, and really just sort of. Um, follow the world and follow the characters in the world and see where they go. I mean, um, you know, I've really had these experiences, which I always thought of as a little bit kind of mystical, but it turns out they're real, where characters end up wanting to do things that you don't necessarily think that they wanted to do, and they will tell you where the story ought to go. I had this experience writing the Dungeon Dynasty where four of the characters... Um, uh, they didn't exist in the first draft and they sort of showed up in the second draft and then insist on, on having their own story. And I just sort of follow them to see where they wanted to go. Um, it's very fun when that happens. Um, and, uh, and, and they're very open. You just, you just sort of open up more and more things as you write novels. Um, short fiction for me is very different. I, I almost always have the shape of the entire thing in my head before I even start writing. I know the shape of it. I know where things are like you know if i can compare things a little bit i can say that writing a novel is a little bit like carving the sphinx you know i'm 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 chiseling here and there but i really don't know the shape of the whole thing as a little worker until i'm done and i can step back and look at the whole thing it takes me a long time to even see that shape but with short fiction it's very different i mean you're you know uh shaping a pot on the wheel and you know in your head what the shape is going to be and you're, you're just going at it um, short fiction for me is a way to explore ideas and to just work out the implications of a very clear central core idea, some v- aspect of reality that I can capture um, using just one sketch of the world. I can't, I, I don't have enough room to, to sketch out, to draw the, to paint the whole thing. I just I have a little sketch. That's it. Um, but it can evoke the whole world. Um for me, short fiction is um, a lot about negative space. It's about leaving things out and then just having the reader fill all those blanks in. You just do enough for the reader to fill the rest of it out. And oftentimes when I'm done with a short story, I'm done with it. I don't have any more stories to tell in that world. It's it's it. That's that's it. This is this is all I wanted to say. Um, but, you know, with something like the Dungeon Dynasty, it's different. It's, it feels like there's endless things to discover in the world. I, I do like short fiction precisely because it allows you to do experiments that are otherwise very difficult to do in novels. Um, to expect somebody to read a, a pseudo anthropological treatise for the entirety of a novel is asking for a lot. But you can do that for maybe 5,000 words. You can write a, a pseudo anthropological paper and expect people to, to deal with it. So that's why I write a lot of short fiction that's very experimental. Either, you know, the whole story is a single sentence or the story is made from a, a, a set of words and then successively cutting out words. Um, or it's a, it's a story in the form of um, a, a dictionary entry or a, a little uh, excerpt from some philosophical treatise. Something like that. You can do experimental things in short fiction um, that I think would not be sustainable over the length of a novel. Um, and I I really think that I will always be very um, attracted to the short form just because it's such a nice, neat way of, of capturing these little glimpses I have of reality uh, that I think are just fascinating. But they don't they're not deep enough to support a whole novel.
um, but they are perfect for a, a little short story to just get that down. The negative space aspect of that is interesting, especially given what you called out earlier in terms of the story as being meant to be misread and for the reader to come in and fill out the rest of the world with whatever their presuppositions or experiences are. I do want to talk a little bit about one story in the paper menagerie, The Perfect Match. And I think about this one a lot because especially these days, I feel like I see people on Twitter or other digital spaces talk about how great it would be for us to have systems that just made all the hard decisions for us. And especially in this world we're seeing of of generative AI systems, people are starting to imagine a world where the entertainment that you consume, the content that you consume is all personalized to you. And so whenever I see those sentiments, I think of your story. And especially after reading it, I feel like personally, those visions of the future don't entirely strike me as versions of the world that I think I want to live in. But I'd love to hear a little bit about your reflections on that story, and perhaps especially in light of some of this discourse we're seeing kind of coupled with the AI advances today, how how you think about it. Yeah, there that story was written a long time ago and, mm-hmm. and reflects um, you know, a lot of the anxieties and understandings about these surveillance based data gathering systems from, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, yeah. A lot of them are still applicable, a lot of them are not. I, I will say that there are aspects of the story that I think are very relevant and interesting um, that I don't see people talk about a lot. And I'll, I'll mention those first. Um, a lot of times people um, uh, miss this one aspect of, of the story that I think is critical, which is whatever you can search for um, exists. Whatever you can't search for does not exist. Whatever is on the internet is real. Whatever is not on the internet is not real. That to me is horrifying probably one of the worst aspects of for all the things that the internet has done that's great that's actually one of the worst consequences thereof but i i don't see enough people worried about it um you know i constantly see situations where um indigenous communities or communities uh of marginalized individuals who don't have a habit of putting things on the internet or you know just historical documents, um, artif- ancient artifacts and, and, and treatises or um, things that are not digitized and put on, on the web. So if you talk about these things as part of your lived experience, as, as, as a part of your personal experience, understanding of the world, and people demand proof and you can't give them a link, um, people are just like, well, then that's not real. You know, it's like picks or it's not real, right? It's that sort of attitude. Um, That's deeply destructive, especially towards uh, communities and cultures that do not have the advantages of digitization, of of having most of their works put onto the web. This this illusion that all human wisdom is on the internet and whatever is on the internet does not exist or is of no value, um, I think it's incredibly dangerous. Um, And I don't see enough people pushing back on it. Related to that is the idea that artificial intelligences can create truth that are neutral and and real. So, for example, I've had people who um, will insist on the idea that a machine translation is accurate um, and the only truth. So when humans do a translation and it comes out to be different than the machine translation, they will say, well, the machine translation must be real. It must be the true one. It has to be the correct one. Um, there are so many mistakes with this. One is the idea that there is a correct translation that is very arguable, even in the case of communicative acts. And it's essentially meaningless in the case of not communicative acts, such as fiction. Um, a translation is a separate work of art, and it has to be done with um, an artistic intent. Uh, and uh, it needs to be approached as, as a, a work of art in that way. So um, a faithful translation in that context is virtually meaningless, or at least a question of great subtlety and nuance. Um, and the fact that the machine gives one translation uh, and people treat that as somehow authoritative, to me, is 
deeply troubling and bizarre. Um, the idea that people would treat a machine translation as somehow authoritative is very strange and scary. Um, so that's another example. So the, 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 the general idea that big data will lead us to distrust personal experience and lived reality is something that I push back over and over again, saying that we, we really need to be cautious about this. And I don't see enough concern about it. I don't see enough people challenging the dominance of machine translation. I don't see enough people saying we really need to be skeptical about machine translations and not treat them as authoritative or more so than human ones. We really need to push back against the idea that um, what is on the internet is authoritative and, and what's not on the internet just doesn't exist. We need to really fight back against it. Uh, so that's one part of the story that I, I, I wish people pay more attention to. The um, In terms of things that I think um, are kind of uh, still interesting from that story is this whole idea of a, a recommendation system allowing to discover things you otherwise wouldn't discover. I, I still think there's actually quite a lot of potential in that idea. It's just that we have not seemed to found a way to really implement it correctly. So, um, so if thinking back to the early years of the internet, there was a lot of optimism about the potential of recommendation systems to really change the market. So the artistic market, um, you know, has this shape where the rich get richer. Um, so you have these mega stars who dominate like 90% of the attention and spending. And then you have this super, super, super long tail of other artists, mid-list artists or even niche artists who have very few fans and very few followers. And it is not true. It's just not true that the megastar is a hundred million times better than somebody here. It's just not. Um, they may be twice as good, but the reality is somebody who's twice as good will get a hundred percent of the attention. Um, so, you know, that that's, um, and, and in fact, for some readers, for whom this author down here would be perfect, they would never even discover that author or artist. They just would never know. There's no way for them to even find out about it because of the attention economy. So early on, there was a lot of optimism that this will be changed in the age of recommendation systems. Like the machines will learn your taste so well, and then would we'll just go out and discover these completely unknown works of art that are just perfect for you. And it will bring them to your attention. So you would have the most amazing uh, reading list. The, 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 you would discover works that are just perfect for you that you would never see otherwise. And then hopefully <clears throat> the long tail would be shaped not quite so steeply like this, but rather more like this. So you would spread the wealth around and all of the little known artists would now have their fan communities and everybody would just be happier. The consumers would be happier because they're matched with better works of art. And the artists will be happier because they have more fans. <laughs> the reality is, you know, of course, as we um, as we we discovered, um, once um, recommendation systems came into being, um, things actually got worse. The 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 mega stars got even more popular because you go on Amazon and see what they recommend you. It's always the best of the best sellers. <laughs> um, uh, and and once the you know they've gotten into advertising, it's even worse. It's whoever can pay for advertising gets pushed up. Um, and every recommendation system seems to follow that trend. You get recommended the most popular music. You get recommended the most popular stories, the most popular movies. Um, it is a case of just. It's, it's, in fact, if anything, it just made the whole um, shape of the curve even more steep. Uh, the popular stars are even more popular, and the mid-list uh, authors and, and writers have essentially disappeared. Um, and, and it's even harder for people to discover those relatively obscure works of art. Um, I still think uh, recommendation systems can be better to actually do what they were intended to do. I think current recommendation systems are too lazy, too safe, too, uh, for whatever reason, um, they are not optimized for the right things. They're optimized for the wrong things. They're optimized to give a okay recommendation rather than a perfect recommendation. An okay recommendation might be the megastar who would please you 80%, but what about this really obscure one? That would give you 100%. Can't, 
can we discover a system that really can discern your taste to that extent? Can we invent a system that really will be able to make better recommendations in the way that I've described? Um, I, I feel like that's a real challenge. And I feel like that can be done maybe without violating privacy, maybe without taking away the sense of autonomy, of, of discovery and uh, serendipity that we require in life. Um, I, I feel like there's still potential for these systems to do good rather than just be a source of, of um, bad advertising. If, if there's one thing that I, I, I can say that um, after a decade plus of experience with large data, it's that um, a lot of the things we were scared of turn out to be not something that these companies are even capable of. We were worried that they would get so specific with recommendations that will be creepy. Turns out that they're just really bad at making recommendations. I often get these ads and I'm like, look, I, you have so much data on me and this is the best you can do. This is terrible. This is not even interesting to me. Surely you can do better. Uh, I mean, the fact that at this point, you know, Facebook still only has like, you know, a, a couple dozen or maybe a hundred categories that they se segregate people into. Come on, this is the best you can do with all that data. This is all you can do. Surely you can do better. Um, so I, I feel like in some ways the failure is an utter failure of implementation. It's you have all this data and yet no interesting recommendation is being generated. The potential of the system to do something interesting and, and, and good and disruptive, whatever that means, is completely um, uh, wasted. Uh, and, and now we just have a privacy nightmare without even any benefits. So maybe we can solve the privacy problem and still give us benefits. Um, that would be ideal. It's a really interesting picture you painted because I feel, well, I guess not just I feel, but many people would know that recommendation systems have really come under the limelight and a lot of scrutiny in recent years, um, both among the general public, but then also policymakers. I guess fam famously, China had its legislation on recommendation algorithms. And to the picture you painted of these things being creepy, it is kind of interesting how that evolved in the public consciousness. I remember watching The Social Dilemma over the pandemic, and as much as I appreciate the work of people like Tristan Harris, I felt like the picture they painted was exactly what you're saying is not true. I remember him saying many times, it's like Facebook, Google, they have billions of dollars of machines that are all aimed right at you and are just creating the perfect thing to keep you hooked into the machine. And there are seeds of truth in there, but I, I felt that picture that he painted was just a little bit too much and having having spent a little bit of time working on a team that developed a recommendation system i can confidently say at least the one i worked on is not nearly as sophisticated as that articulation makes it out to be <laughs> that's the thing they gather all this data and they're not doing anything interesting with it so you just have a privacy nightmare without any kind of <laughs> benefit it, it's uh it truly is comical mm-hmm I think the other interesting aspect of what you said, too, was the fact that these systems aren't good enough and still could be better. There's a lot of hoopla about these companies really optimize for, for metrics like profit when it comes to recommendation systems, time on site. And it's interesting to me that if they were to flip the script a little bit and start thinking about the things you said in terms of offering you maybe something on the long tail of the distribution as opposed to the most popular thing. I mean, that that feels like very much the the popular explore exploit trade off. Sometimes I might recommend you something bad, but sometimes I might get it right and give you something. And in the long term, that could also very much be better for the types of metrics that these companies want to optimize for anyway. So when you look at you look at the incentives there, it's like they are playing it safe in some respect. And so maybe in the long term, they're kind of at, at a local maximum of the time they could get you to spend on site. But if they were to risk, be, if they were to be a little bit more risky in terms of the offerings they give you, it's kind of interesting that even with respect to the things that they want to optimize for that people may or may not be too happy about, they could possibly do better in that regard. 
I think so. I think so. I think there's potential there. Yeah. I think that the the stories in The Hidden Girl, which is more recent, definitely talk a little bit more directly about some of the questions we're considering today. Um, and there are a couple in here that I would find really interesting for us to discuss. Since I mentioned real artists earlier, maybe we can start with this one. Um, and if I remember right, you you wrote this, I think it first got published somewhere in 2013. Um, and this is really on AI usurping creative arts. And I think that the picture it paints of, I guess, you know, this this girl, Sophia, who wants to get involved in in this company, Semaphore's movie making, really discovers that what it is to create a movie and what her role in it would be is something very different from what she imagined. And I'd love to hear kind of what was going on in your head as you were writing that story. So um, I've been fascinated by one aspect of technology that, um, you know, uh, that would fall within what I consider technology, but not necessarily within um, the, the the realm of technology for a lot of other people, which is um, Hollywood as a technology. So um, not many people know this, but one of the greatest American inventions to modern storytelling is the writer's room. Uh, it's really an American invention, the idea of having a bunch of writers come together to collectively create a story like this. The, the showrunner... Um, writer's room model of modern American TV has been exported to a lot of other places. And so, you know, when Netflix has shows from India, Korea, whatever, a lot of them are explicitly uh, taking advantage of this American technology of the writer's room uh, to generate these shows. Uh, it's it's a really fascinating um, model for collective intelligence that I, 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 I found to be very uh, fascinating to study. Um, so, the thing is, when you study these models of uh, of creativity after a while, you get the sense that people would like to make them into formulas. People would like to turn them into repeatable things. Like, you know, um, is there a way for us to use artificial intelligence to replace the writer's room? Can we capture uh, this 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 thing and 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 make it repeatable? Right? Because investors in in movies are always there's this you know very old um uh, uh nugget about hollywood which is that you know people love movies but the business of movie making is terrible because it's unpredictable Cre creatives are unmanageable there's it's very hard to predict whether a movie will do well or not you can have the best stars and what you think of as the best script and it comes out and it just flops. Why? Nobody knows. You can have a lot of stories, but who knows if the stories are true. So a lot of AI companies and machine learning companies have been in the business of trying to optimize for this, trying to analyze, is there a pattern between successful movies and return on investment? Is there some way you can discern ad initio whether a product, a project like a movie will be successful or not? So taking all of those ideas together, I came up with the idea of Semaphore as a movie studio. It's a, it's a studio that's somewhat similar to Pixar, ostensibly, except that its real filmmaker is this artificial intelligence. And the way it makes movies is it just starts out by generating a random set of um, uh, animated scenes. And then it shows them to a room of people and then observes the people using cameras to record their micro expressions and map that to the plot line. Um, and then it just tries to optimize it. It, it has a um, emotional curve for every genre of movie it, it tries to make. And it just starts to randomize these images, trying to show them over and over again to audiences and, and until it optimized its um, animated movie to be a masterpiece, a thing that will elicit the best emotional response curve from the audience. And that's what makes Semaphore successful. It's it's an AI uh, filmmaker that's designed, that's turned uh, creativity into a pure act of optimization. And Sophia um, is, is being recruited by the company because the company believes that um, even in this world, who sits in the audience matters. And the, the filmmakers are saying that 
the the studio has been unsuccessful with appealing to some audience members because they feel that they don't have test subjects with the best taste. And the company is thinking that perhaps uh, an actual human filmmaker like Sophia can help them improve by becoming part of the test audience um, because great artists need great taste. And so perhaps even Sophia were not to make the movies herself, her taste uh, would become the input to um, the algorithm to make the best movie. And of course, you know, Sophia imagining herself as, you know, just sort of an audience member sitting there who whose only contribution to the final art is her response um, is kind of horrified by this. Um, and I think, you know, it sort of portrays a lot of artists fear about what augmented creativity really means. Because uh, a lot of times when we talk about machine augmented creativity, we talk about how humans are still there to curate, to 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 choose. Right. But if you take that to its extreme, the the, the human plays a relatively passive role um, of acting as just a high, you know, um, uh, a high pass filter of sorts to, to, to get the most uh, interesting uh, um, output. Uh, that just does not feel to a human artist like a fulfilling role. And, and my story was meant to capture some of that anxiety, that sense of, of, of dread um, in, a, in, a, in a world in which machine augmented creativity would take that route. Um, so, you know, in retrospect, and now that I work with machines a little bit more, I don't think we're anywhere near that stage. And I don't think we'll, I doubt we'll actually ever get there. I feel like at the point where AI is capable of making movies that are actually meaningful and, 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 and engage us as deep works of art, then these machine filmmakers will be intelligent in a truly empathetic way. Like we'll be able to relate to these entities as empathetic independent beings. Um, and then collaborating with them will largely be like collaborating with a fellow brilliant um, mind. Um, and we know how to do that. Um, so I, I, I think I think it would be very different from how it's described in in the story. At least that's my my that's my feeling. That makes sense to me, and I think migrating to the debates we're seeing in the AI world today, I think a lot of what you said kind of relates to that question of what do these AI systems have to look like in order to produce these you know, empathetic works of art. And there, I think there are a lot of different perspectives. There are many people who seem to be convinced of the scaling hypothesis that you just take these tech systems and, you know, you give them more parameters, train them on more data, and you solved all of intelligence. And you've, of course, got different camps. You've got people who believe that embodiment is a really important next step for them to actually deeply engage with the world around them and have some kind of grounding to the language they use, which I personally am pretty sympathetic to. But yeah, it, it does make sense to me what you said that you would you would expect a level, I guess not to, you know, call back to Blake Lemoyne, but you know, something like sentience in a system that is going to be capable of producing something that feels really deeply, viscerally like a work of art to me. I think that is right. Um, I mean, the scaling hypothesis, there's, you know, so far it has worked. So, you know, saying that it's not going to work, I, I don't know that. Hard to say. Uh, so far it has, has worked. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I really do feel like we're coming up on the limit of what that approach can do. It has certainly done more than some of us ever expected. Um, if you told me, you know, 20 years ago when I was in college that um, that one day neural networks without understanding anything will be capable of doing something like GPT, chat GPT-3. I would have been just laughed in your face. It's inconceivable, but you know, obviously it worked. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's certainly, I don't know. There's, when I when I spoke to Francois Chalet, who has like a very particular set of opinions on this, I think that he he made the very good point that a lot of these problems where when we step back a couple of decades, a couple of years, and are like, it's inconceivable that a system could do that. When you look at them now, 
I think he's right that a lot of these things like text to image, like what chat GPT does very well are things that look mathematically like manifold manipulation when you have enough data for a neural network to understand it that way. And so naturally they are going to be very good at that, but then you, you put it out of its comfort zone just a little bit. And I think you, you do see those failures with a, with a very clear eye. Right. But it's 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 just interesting to me, though, that 20 years ago, had you asked me the question, I wouldn't have seen the distinction. I would have just sure. thought it's just all of it is impossible. But, you know, so it's, it's it's very interesting that what has become possible. Everything is, is very clear in retrospect, I suppose. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> There's another set of stories you have here that um, I think you have this singularity trilogy in in The Hidden Girl. And. I guess there are a few pieces of these stories that I think might be interesting for us and the listeners. But one bit that I thought was really interesting was that you chose Moore's proof of an external world as your epigraph for the gods have not died in vain. And I wanted to ask what what made you choose Moore's proof as an epigraph? It's always been just particularly uh, striking to me as a as a as an image, you know, the idea of how do you. It it, it feels to me like a, a comment on embodiment, on on, on experience, on reality uh, that that to me gets at some something fundamental about the universe that we can reduce to just abstractions and mathematical. Um, uh, representation. Um, also, uh, I think it's one of those things where, um, it's one of those core memories for me. You know, when I first encountered the, 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 the story, it just made a very deep impression on me. Um, and, uh, it's something that I thought about a lot, uh, for many days, um, and, and trying to think about what it means and then what I think about it. Um, I think we all have these experiences where something, some small kernel, some thing sticks in our head and becomes the little kernel around which a pearl grows and then becomes something that we end up treasuring. And, and we can't even explain it if we try to explain the process by which this little thing that refused to let go of our minds became the core of this pearl. Um, we can't describe the process exactly, but we know it's there and it ends up being... Um, something that we 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 uh, we can't quite get away from, and becomes important to the way we understand the world. So that's 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 how it is for me. Yeah, it's it's interesting just looking at the actual proof itself. More is just like, how do I know that two human hands exist? Well, here's my left hand, here's my right hand, and that often gets introduced in like intro philosophy classes as you know a, a canonical like circular argument, but. I think your your read on that kind of story, there is something really deep there about just naturally the way in which we construct our certainty about the world around us and then how deeply our, our embodiment relates to that. I mean, of course, you have like the, the Cartesian skepticism and all of that, but it is interesting to kind of step back and think about just why this motive verification this kind of certainty seems seems so natural it also feels like a part of the narrative tendency in our minds that that this is a story that we can believe in um as opposed to other stories uh there's something about that too that i think appeals to us yeah so there's a really interesting i guess set of things in these stories that i think might be kind of interesting and so I think that they they sort of get at a couple of themes, one of them sort of the, I guess, differences that people who, so I guess maybe just to set out a little bit of context for for listeners, um, you know, in, in the Singularity Trilogy, for example, you have a young girl named Maddie, her father, who's an uploaded consciousness, um, you have the looming risk of like hostile AI systems, and in a lot of these stories, there is this aspect of you have some people who have stayed behind, as it were, who are still embodied, living in the physical world. And then you have people who are entirely uploaded, and there's this kind of gap between them. And so I guess just imaginatively, I wonder how these stories came about for you. Um, 
and what you think about that division and kind of how it maps to some of the technological advances we're seeing today. I think like the metaverse is a particular one where we are seeing this kind of embodied versus virtual world sort of distinction rise up. Yeah, this came out of largely um, uh, my um, examination of uh, the the set of arguments around the singularity and advocates for the singularity. I always felt to me like um, the, the these arguments always felt to me somewhat analogous to religious arguments about the rapture. You know, the the the, the way the singularity is described often is very similar to the rapture. That the idea that we're all going to live in the cloud uh, like gods. Um, I am not particularly convinced that we're anywhere near the singularity or that we are ever going to get there. Um, not in terms of AI surpassing human intelligence, but in terms of humans being able to live in the cloud among gods. I'm not convinced that is, in fact, the future. Um, it's possible. Um, and so a lot of uh, the stories are sort of written as a way to explore. Let's just say that that metaphor is true and we can actually do it. What does that mean, really? What does that mean in terms of um, human values and what it means to be human? If if these individuals are no longer embodied in the way that we are, but they were embodied at one point, what does that mean? Like, how does that change the way they think of themselves as humans? How does that change the way we think about what it means to be human? And if you just can now, you have all your human emotions and your own biases and, and so on, and now you're just a much more powerful and faster what does that do to you, to your relationship to those who are still in the physical world? I find those questions very interesting um, because they're a way to explore, for me anyway, what I consider to be uh, core aspects of being human. What are the things that I think are actually constants uh, across these supposed changes in embodiment and, and hardware? What are the things that I think of as pure human. And then later on, as I started to explore the idea of digital beings, beings who are born digital in this way, how are they human and how are they post-human? Um, what does that even mean? What are the things that they can abandon from us? And what are the things that they can have that we can never have? Um, I just find these questions very interesting because they, 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 this is something that has fascinated storytellers since forever. Right? We've always had stories of heroes who join the immortals somehow. And, you know, what, how does that change them? What does that mean? Um, and I wanted to, to, to give a modern spin on that, um, informed by our understanding of, of consciousness and, um, and so on. I think that this is a really good place for us to move towards some closing thoughts, because I think also what you just said about the story really highlights science fiction as a mechanism for, using for creating thought experiments about what's really core to us as people. And so as perhaps a, a last question, I think that we are now speaking at a time where AI is becoming more and more a part of the public consciousness beyond just technologists, especially with systems like chat GPT. And there are more and more worries about job loss. There, I think, is sort of a lot of ambivalence. There's a lot of optimism about where AI is leading us, but at the same time, there's a lot of pessimism. And so I, I think, Ken, my last question to you would be, what do you see as the role of science fiction in a world where we are seeing these dizzying changes, I think? And perhaps as a sub-question to that, um, how do you think that technologists, people working in AI, should engage with and think about stories in in doing their work and, and thinking about the future? Um I, I you know I I don't think science fiction is particularly about predicting the future. I do think science fiction is very important in, in helping us think about our relationship to technology, meaning thinking of technology as a part of the core of what it means to be human as opposed to something external to it. We've always been technological beings. We've always been cyborgs. We've always placed aspects of ourselves and externalized them into crafted things and crafted systems. That has not changed. And if anything, it's just, you know, the trend is accelerating in some sense. Um, but 
I feel like science fiction is uniquely qualified for getting us to think about that to, because it treats technology as a core part of of the world and, and treats technology as another character, as an aspect of our own character in the way that I think a lot of realist fiction um, does not have a tradition of doing. Um, so I think that's what's so key about science fiction. It, it, it tries to elevate technology to a core part of humanity and to think about our relationship to technology as a co-evolution, as a, as a way of we craft our houses, but then the houses craft us. Um, in terms of what technologists can do with stories, I think um, technologists can embrace stories. Stories are core to um, our um, being. And I think one of the ways that I like people to think about technology is think of technology as a part of your language, as a part of your expression to the world. When you're crafting something, a system, a piece of software, an app, a, a hardware object, you are really placing aspects of your soul out there and telling the story about who you are. Um, so technologists are not crafting things to make a profit. I, I really don't think um, the most passionate technologists are out there because they think this will make them the most money. Maybe some do. I, I don't know any who are. I think they're out there because they want to change the universe. Um, uh, they want to make a dent in the universe, um, uh, as, as Steve Jobs put it. You, you're, you're doing this because the technology is your epic poem. It is your story. It is your expression to the world about who you are. So think about what is the story you're trying to tell the world with your technology? What is it? What is the core value you're trying to embrace, perpetuate, validate, valorize? Um, and, and make sure that you are doing the best you can in telling that story. Um, and I always tell everybody this as a benediction. Um, may you get to tell the story you want to tell. Um, it's actually very hard to do that. And if you get to do that, um, even a little bit of it, uh, you are very lucky and I, I'm very happy for you. I think that's a, that's a really beautiful thought to end on. Um, Ken, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me today. I'm a huge fan of your work. I hope any listeners who have not already read your, your fiction will go ahead and do so. And I'll, I'll make sure to point them to all of those places. Um, but again, it was really wonderful speaking to you. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Daniel. This has been such a pleasure. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. And that is a wrap, my friends. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can subscribe to The Gradient on Substack to receive not just this podcast, but also our articles and newsletters directly to your email. You can also visit us at thegradient.pub, where you'll find all of that, as well as more information about The Gradient and how you could even contribute if you're interested. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to leave a comment or review, we'd love to know how we can make this series more interesting and informative to you. And with all that, I'll leave you until the next episode.